Hello, friends. Uh, I hope you're doing well. I was uh, thinking about uh, this person that you may have heard about, a uh, very important man, Philip Pinel. Uh, he is the man who struck the chains uh, from the ankles of uh, the chronically mentally ill uh, after he realized that this wasn't helping and that there were better, more humane ways of uh, treating them. So he's famous for that. There's a famous picture of him, you know, uh, telling the locksmith to, you know, unchain this uh, uh, lady, this is prisoner. I mean, I guess they were in prison. There was a hospital, but they were kept there against their will. So he's unchaining uh, the patient over there, and he's standing proudly by, supervising and ensuring that it is done. And so he um, he's famous for that, and you know he should be. Uh, it was really um, inhumane the way uh, the mentally ill were treated. It has vastly improved. If you think they're you know, violations now, you don't know how bad it was in fact then. People were chained uh, to the wall for years, you know, they did everything what they needed right there. And, um, and it was bad. <laughs> so he recognized, hey, this is not working. And, uh, uh, but he was very objective about it. Uh, we have to go back in his history to get a full sense of, uh, you know, where he was from and how he arrived and how he did what he did. So this is a uh, young man from south of France. He was born and brought up in a well-to-do family. His father was a doctor and they were you know, financially well endowed. So after he grew up, uh, he was very you know, curious, bright, you know, and uh, very sensitive emotionally. And, uh, and there was some debate about uh, where he should go. Medicine, or the other choice was, uh, you know, become a priest, and that was a big thing in those days. So, um, and it, you know, so he ended up going to the seminary, I guess. He may have wanted to also. Um, you know, I don't think they could force somebody to go to a seminary. But uh, anyway, he went to the seminary and, um, um, when he got there, he studied, he was, you know, he's a good uh, mind, but his heart wasn't into it. He was, uh, you know, he was still interested in the procedures his father uh, would do. He was a medical doctor, as I mentioned. And he was more and more anima animated and captivated by that side uh, of uh, his life. So, you know, I guess they must have had a discussion, the father and son, and he decided to go into medicine, to medical school. So he did that, Philip Pinel, he went to medical school in the province that uh, they were in, and uh, it was uh, Toulouse, and went to, you know, uh, several years of training in that area, and then went to Paris, and over there, you know, like the medical establishment there was just as snobbish as they can be now. <laughs> they would uh, uh, not um, recognize his license because it was from a regional school, and you know these guys, they're bloodletting to cure disease, but they, you know, they had ensconced themselves and thought they were knowledgeable and convinced everybody else they knew what they were doing, and you know the petty and uh, uh, excluded Pinel. Okay, so this man um, had put many years of his life into a profession he loved, and they wouldn't let him practice medicine. So he survived. He, he was a writer and uh, he wrote uh, other people's essays, did their homework, and, um, and earned a living. Uh, and uh, he did that for 10, 15 years. Um, it was kind of, uh, you know, he didn't mind the extra, you know, the essay writing and all this, kind of a nerd. You know, and uh, it went, um, he made the best of it. You know, this was uh, got to be around uh, the time of the French Revolution, 1780s, uh, and um, so he started hanging out with this group of intellectuals that would talk about, you know, uh, progressive social ideas, and uh, he, you know, he was sympathetic to their cause, 
and he ingratiated himself, um, not overtly, but just by his nature. He was uh, cordial and convivial, and so people liked him. So when the French Revolution happened, and you know his friends came to power, they made him the medical director of the hospitals in Paris, including this hospital, Bisset, Bissetrière. Uh, I'm probably mangling the French. But it's a famous, uh, it was a huge hospital, like 5,000 people back then. There was that, and then there was another hospital, saint Petrière, And these are like big, huge asylums where with uh, up to, you know, several thousand people. And in these asylums were a lot of indigent women. Women somehow represented a higher than, uh, you know, the sex ratio percentage, higher than 50%, you know. And they were, um, they had, they were, uh, you know, either severely mentally ill or uh, mentally, you know, intellectually handicapped. And uh, um, so them and then the men prisoners were there too, you know, everybody was there, the prisoners, uh, the severely mentally ill, uh, the indigent, and uh, you know, those that uh, um, were not intellectually able to you know, support themselves. And he started to, he was more fascinated by the mentally ill patients over there. So he would pay attention to it. And um, there was um, a man there and his wife, John pa Baptiste, and Marguerite was his wife. They were very good at handling the psychiatric patients. And he observed them and he saw what they did, you know. And he saw that uh, uh, John Baptiste was kind you know, uh, always uh, modeled compassion, patience, and um, uh, and it was also firm when it's needed. But he was like a gentle, guiding, supportive, nurturing parent to them. And he would remember details. He would take real interest in them. And then he got better results. So um, he recognized that there was something there. And at some point, you know, and he realized that, you know, chaining these patients wasn't helping. And he was objective as a, you know, very rational person. He was a student of, uh, you know, the philosophers of logic um, uh, and uh, Hippocrates. Hippocrates, as you know, was a very logical, rational man who would, like say, collect the data, analyze it, and figure out a rational cause. So, you know, he, for example, connected, this is a side, Hippocrates, you know, you know, made the connection that when you had swampy areas, then people got sick of malaria. And he thought that it was the miasma or the gases around there that caused it. And, but of course, it was the mosquitoes that were, you know, breeding in the uh, swamps and that would uh, waylay the travelers and, you know, spread the infection that way. Anyway, Hippocrates was his model, he was logically inclined. And when he saw that uh, John Baptiste and his wife were having success, he thought, he recognized that this was the way things ought to be. And so for one, he stopped, uh, he, he started the process of unchaining the uh, patient that had been chained for years and that were you know, not violent. And they gradually, you know, they did this in steps and gradually, but they started it. And so uh, Philip is rightly credited and given credit for that uh, you know, historic uh, event. Uh, he then instituted uh, a system of uh, therapy that he called moral therapy. And it was basically treat, to treat these individuals in a humane way, expect the best about them, and guide them gently. Philip uh, was also not big on medications. They didn't have much. They usually had opiate type um, agents, you know, and uh, they would um, basically, basically sedate them, you know, um, maybe calm them, of course, and uh, but they wouldn't last, you know. And uh, he, you know, he was kind of like not very big on medications. He advocated more a uh, psychosocial uh, type intervention. So um, so when he, later on he was um, sent to Salpetriere. Salpetriere was a, Salpetriere is, you know, gunpowder 
Salpetriere was a big factory, gun, you know, powder factory, and that was converted to um, uh, this huge asylum. And he was in charge over there. And he called all the John Baptiste and his wife uh, also came and they helped him run the mental health wards in that uh, new hospital. Uh, people took notice, you know, and uh, they were ready and ripe for revolutionary ways of doing things, changing things up. And uh, of course, this was something that did need to be changed up. And it was. Uh, he inspired others. Uh, uh, William Tuke is an individual that also, you know, transplanted the moral therapy model and it migrated to the United States with Benjamin Rush. So, you know, while we um, think about, you know, mental health, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's always a lot of um, interesting news uh, about uh, mental health issues. Although, you know, it's a bit deluged with this, you know, mental health issues, but we need to remember that the father of psychiatry, I would call him the father of psychiatry, uh, Philip Pinel, um, uh, you know, made sacrifices, took stands. This is him, you know, telling the guys to unchain them. So, um, you already saw that picture. This is the Salpetriere, a uh, huge place. You know, these huge uh, asylums were, became models for um, uh, state hospitals in the United States. So, and they were based on the moral, you know, the moral therapy. And true to that to calling, uh, they had these palatial grounds, uh, you know, good architecture. Uh, they had their own farm, you know, they would have, you know, hold balls and try to simulate a normal, uh, you know, life for them. It was almost a mini town uh, uh, and sometimes had their own zip codes. So, if, you know, Philip Pinel was an important individual a very kind, generous, sensitive soul that uh, liberated and unchained the suffering uh, masses of humanity, uh, you know, hidden in dungeons and chained to the walls. He liberated them. You know, uh, two thumbs up for him. Great. <laughs> Good. Thank you.